So I really wanted you guys to connect because I'm interested in how both of your work engages in this idea of sustainability in relation to the working artist. And I was wondering if both of you, maybe we can start with Danae, could say like how you got started in this idea of sustainability and what is your definition of sustainability? Okay, um, I think I started with survivability. <laughs> Moving to New York was like, can we make it? Can we stay here? Mm -hmm. And then sustainability, and then I think where I'm at now is around building wealth, and what and what are the many types of wealth, and how does that how does a system of wealth building happen that will support your work as an artist, so that you can continue to make work over a longer period of time. So I think that's. Kind of where I have come. Longevity. Yes. 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 Okay. And for you, Russell? Uh, for me, I think that just in general, artists are, is, being an artist is a resilient practice. Mm -hmm. um, you have to kind of figure things out. Um, I think now um, we have to have, art as artists, we have to think differently on how we engage the market, um, not in reliance on old ways, old systems of doing, but how do you actually develop a sustainable practice, economically sustainable practice, um, by way of thinking about your art as a trade, um, uh, not just a creative practice, but then how does that creative practice transform into a trade that you actually want to exchange with someone? Um, and once you do that, you know, there's a, a psychological transformation of like, oh, I'm a business person. And oftentimes in the past, business and art or artists as an entrepreneur, they didn't work. And I think what we're doing is we're seeing a transition of creative practitioners, um, which are tremendously artists, um, are starting to embrace that, right? And it's filling the gaps of where a lot of art schools are not preparing them for, you know, the marketplace. So, um, like, it's like how do artists start to institutionalize some of their ideas where they can sustain not just a couple of years, but they can look you know, decades old. That's amazing. So both of you have talked about this idea of work, this, the importance of you need to put in the energy and the effort in to make something last and to create a plan and framework for it. So that's akin to this idea of hustling, right? Um, and that's something I hear all the time constantly, like, oh, you gotta, you gotta hustle, gotta work on your side hustle. Like, I think it's a trendy term almost. So I guess my question for both of you again would be, like, can you actually just des describe a moment in your career um, where you've had to hustle yeah. and what you've learned from that? I, and my career did not start out, start out in art or culture. Mm -hmm. um, I am a trained technologist and worked in technology for 14 years before I made the transition. Um, and in order to enter that space, I had to hustle because um, the cultural sector has gatekeepers and old guards, and you have to fit very specific criteria, go to the right schools, have the right people green light you in order to get in the space, especially when you're trying to go into the museum and gallery space. Um, and I kind of did things my own way, you know. Um, the kind of the broken way is just kind of hustling. Um, I have an idea, instead of trying to get someone to sponsor my idea, let me just try it out, get a proof of concept, okay, that worked, and I'll leverage that proof of concept to get, you know, support around it. And my work really started off Early, my early days was doing a lot of work in bed uh, which then translated into Afropunk, early days of Afropunk doing the, um, the artist wall. So we, every concert had an artist wall. So that went from that um, to started curating shows on my own that I financed myself. Um, and that, like, I didn't have any money but I financed it myself anyways. Because for me, if I have an idea, if I'm not willing to put that energy and finance into myself, how can I expect someone else to? Um, so it really talks about investment. Oftentimes, investment looks at the external investment to something else. Um, and you know, I grew up with kind of self resiliency. My mother taught me that at a very young age. So hustling was in my DNA. At a certain point, you hit a, a glass ceiling at hustling. And when does hustling become professionality? And how do you transform that into a career? Interesting. For you today. Um, so I have a good friend, and we had this other FaceTime conversation, and she was like, yeah, girl, grinding leads to dust. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to put on a t-shirt, grinding leads to dust. So I think um, for me, hustle 
Well, I will say when I first moved to New York, it was definitely hustle because, like I said, I was just trying to survive. I was like, okay, we moved to the city with our one suitcase. We're going to do it. I'm going to be a dancer. And it was like doing the audition circuit, which is a form, you know, its own hustle. But I've been really interested. And I feel like this whole year, I'm like, it's rest and recovery. I'm interested in working less. (laughs) I'm interested in, um, in, I think also for my creative process, the stress of just stress is not good for my for creative my creative process so I'm trying to figure out how do I create spaces of like peace and wellness Mm -hmm. while I still pay all of my bills and save money and pay for me paying off my debt was a huge Mm -hmm. part of that because I was like well what are all the sort of stressors around my work that are not necessary for it and how can I remove them to try to create as much space as I can so now I've tried to create a schedule where I um, I'm trying to work, make more money in less time, mm, okay. so that way there's more space, so yeah. there's more chill. Sure. And then there's less hustle. Yes. <laughs> and so I think that's where, that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm in chill mode. Okay. As much as I can. Yeah. No, I think it's really interesting. This is not really a question, but I think you guys kind of described both like two sides of this idea of self investment too, because. Rasu, you were saying like you gotta you gotta believe in yourself and keep going and if you have this idea, keep pushing forward. And Danae, you also said that to a certain extent, but you also are recognizing the like this need to to take a step back too, mm-hmm. also and be re, be um, a bit reflective about what the work that you've put in. Right. So this very holistic view, I think. Right. Because the city yeah. will the city will let you work. Yeah. you die like the city if you let the city it will just continue working you yeah and you'll be like oh my gosh i've been in new york city for all these years and i'm just tired <laughs> so <laughs> so i think that if you let it the city will okay make you just like run and you have to kind of say you have to decide what are what am i running i always ask myself am i running or am i walking like okay. am I in a place where i'm like trying to get this project done so i'm kind of like moving mm-hmm. at a certain clip and then there's times where it's like, okay, we're walking, we've you know saved up for this month, we need to make sure to make space to address things that maybe don't get addressed when you're in hustle mode. It's yeah. very easy to like let your health care slip, to let your just like basic paperwork, mm-hmm. you're getting your taxes done, getting your accounting done. It's like, because you're so busy hustling, you know, who's taking care of yes. the books? Yes. And my next question, um, for Asu, is how do you imagine the like the future of the working artist, given this, given the work that you both are doing within mm-hmm. sustainability? Yeah, artists in general, creatives. I'll just go broader to creatives, okay. right? Yeah. Um, creatives need to get their act together, mm-hmm. you know, because the economy is shifting towards a freelance economy or gig economy, as we call it, mm-hmm. right? Um, so right now we're around forty three percent gig economy. They say by 2027, we'll be at 50%, maybe a little bit above 50% gig economy. So that basically means, and what that means in layman's terms is that the average person won't have a day job. The average person is freelancing, hustling, hustling, you know, to get check to check. The ones that's gonna be able to survive that, the ones that actually have structures, frameworks in place in order to um, engage the marketplace. And for me, that's, once I had a breakthrough of understanding life, the difference between home and Marketplace, it shifted everything for me, right? Home. Do you think you can elaborate? Yeah, so sure. So, like, home is ideas that, or the idea of, you know, just this is me, this is my practice, my values. Marketplace is what you're when you're exchanging, mm-hmm. right? So that exchange could be social, or that 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 exchange could be um, transactional. Mm-hmm. So once I understood that, um, I started to really start organizing myself on the marketplace versus home. It makes me think about how I pay for my work now and how that's changed. And I was like, I'm not going to pay for my work. That was one thought. Um, and also, I, because I was on an intense, in, like, intense budgeting process, mm-hmm. a lot of dance, you know, you have costumes, you have, you have a lot of things that you're paying for, tech people, this and that. And I was like, well, what does it look like to make work in a way that I can afford to make it myself? And I think everything is so professionalized content wise like everybody expects like all your videos to look really great all your photos to be magazine level like everything is has to be it's like you're competing with like a creative advertising house in terms of 
quality mm -hmm. of production, production quality. And I've been really pulling myself away from that and saying, what can I make that's really interesting and unique with just the resources that I have that are not going to stress me out? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was just doing a thing where I'm like, okay, I will try blogging in my house, and I have this like closet behind me that has hooks, and like maybe I'll hang different things on the mm -hmm. hooks as like part of the background. Yeah. And I think a, a really good work comes can come out of having some of those limitations where you're not like, oh well, I have to hire a sound person and yeah. do this and do that. So you like create. This production around yourself when it's like can you do that every week affordably mm -hmm. and if not then I'm like okay, what is the most interesting thing you can make with what you have and let sort of where you actually are in life like shine through the yeah. work because I actually think it makes the work more interesting because not everything has to be like this super super polished yeah. right. um, work to be interesting and actually and I think you learn more about I would say that my work took off more when I started doing when I started saying like, well, th these are all the pieces that I have, or like, I bought all these costumes for this other work, what else can I make with them? And it sort of forced me to go back, open my craft closet, which was like a million pieces of sparkle, and be like, okay, <laughs> none of this sparkle's making money in the closet. <laughs> okay, so we need to like, we need to make, what are we making? <laughs> yeah. Um, and really trying to like use up what I have, like yeah. put things to work and that, made my art budget go down to like $50 a month that I might be spending on my work. Mm -hmm. um, but then I'm selling that work for maybe a 500 to 1,000 performance. So now we've created actual, the ability to make a lot of money off of every piece of work sure. if you're choosing to sell it in the marketplace. Not everything you may want to sell, you might want to keep some things for yourself right. or yeah. it's part of just your process. But I'm like, how can I increase what they would call your margins? Like, this is how much it costs me to make it. Mm -hmm. This is how much I will make off of it. Whereas I think in, when I first moved to New York, my mindset was, oh, I need to save all this money so I can rent a theater for two weekends. Or I need to save all this money so I can pay for this many dancers. So the idea of like rather than like saving up to then level up your Just artwork, that it's like out. work from your most sustainable place, yeah. make it as interesting as possible, and there will be a market for it because it will have an honesty to it. Right. So it kind of sounds like through sustainability practices in, in relation to to art and creative practitioners that. Well, those who have a sustainability practice that themselves, there's more of a potential for an originality to come to come through. Um, that idea of value, something meaningful, when we're in a society that's so saturated with things that aren't very meaningful, that are very glossy, as you're saying. Um, so that wasn't really a question, but that was just what I was getting from yeah, you. Yeah, and, and I think it's less, like, I think it's less stressful. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think there's something to be said of like, what type of work do you make when you're not stressed? And once I took away all of the like, okay, we don't have to have like a sound person. Like, I was like, okay, what do we actually like? What do I really actually need? Mm -hmm. And I bought this iPhone. It apparently can do lots of things if I really get up in there. <laughs> if I start downloading some apps, yeah. like you know, we have really actually very sophisticated art making tools, but we still feel the pressure to do, like, just reach beyond sure. and go into debt. I know a lot of dancers have gone into debt for producing shows mm -hmm. because they're like, okay, I need to produce a big show so I can get good footage, so I can apply to this grant, because the grant requires like yeah. uncut, high-res yeah. footage. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there's just, and it's, it's just way less stressful. Yeah. And yeah. so I think that I also am more likely to experiment because I'm not spending mm -hmm. a lot of money per iteration. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, I produced this show, it cost me $5,000. I can't produce a $5,000 show every two weeks, but I can produce a $20 show every two weeks. Yeah. And like whatever that looks like, and so then like the work gets to change and grow mm -hmm. for me a lot faster. Yeah, because it's the spend is yeah. much more sustainable. Yeah, I've got a friend who just kind of uh, broke through um, as a successful artist um, by um, financial definition, and one of the conversations a very passing conversation. Um, was asking him about you know um, if you had you know how would if you were to duplicate this would have started over again, how would, how would you duplicate it? And he was like, you know, having a process is really important, mm -hmm. um, but not just having a process for the work that you do, but also like, if you remember when Michael Jordan used to play, he used to get in the zone, mm -hmm. but the fundamentals of his game allowed him to have to get those phenomenal zone breakthroughs. 
Um, so the, when you have a structure, it allows for phenomena of breakthroughs to occur. And I think a lot of us, we are just waiting for that breakthrough. Um, but you need to have a bit of a structure in order for the, when the breakthrough come, you know exactly what to do with it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Structure and a team. Because yeah, he I, does have a team. Because it's that's like... like one person. <laughs> yeah, yeah the one person team. Yeah. But there's like... Yeah. Like I said, when I'm working around like wealth or extreme wealth situations, I'm like, oh, they have like a whole group of people in yeah. charge of making sure the bills are paid, that yeah. the taxes are done right, that this is, I'm like, oh, Check can, their you, emails. Can, can you imagine <laughs> if you had someone take care of all the administrative parts of wow, your life, would you would have amazing. so There's much like, time yeah. to do other things. That, but that then, I guess, right. if once you're really talking about making a good amount of money or even trying to approach wealth building, you really have to have a good team of people and I think those that's something artists can do right now is like start building those relationships like okay. do you have a good accountant do you have a good entertainment lawyer do you have you know a good tech person that okay. can, if you're doing live performance like have you built um, a system that you have people screening things mm -hmm. so that way you know is this a should I be signing this contract or not and it's like it can take time to build that network, but I think the best time to do it is like before yeah. you need it. Yeah. Like you're like, oh, you should go to like a meetup for entertainment lawyers yeah. that's free, just to like start Network. meeting people yeah. or like when your friend has a big show and they have, you know, made it. Look at who's their agent, who's their literary agent, who's their speaking exactly. agent, because all of these relationships you might need later, and you always gonna pay more for something when you have to buy it on the spot. Mm. But if you have pre plan and like build the relationship organically. Sometimes people might charge you less because they're like, oh yeah, you've been like following my work for a while and I've been following your work for a while. Okay. But I think it's like, do you have essentially your wealth building team gotcha. with you um, when opportunities do come up? Or if you could We've been talking about this idea of incubators and spaces for art artists and creatives to come together. Um, so I guess this is kind of more like reflective, um, but why why is the LP such a great space for that kind of, for those conversations to just happen and uh, like have that initial start there? Because most, most of the artists are young or like mid-level in their career, still trying to figure it out, so yeah. I'll jump on it because I mean, <laughs> we talk about it all the time is there's really no organization that does it authentically, mm -hmm. period, right? So if you're looking at artists who are working with communities in a very um, authentic and integral way, um, also socially engaged artists, there are now institutions flexing and bending to have that conversation, sprinkling some of the language into their initiatives, mm -hmm. but it's not in their core values. Um, LP is unique because engaging communities, engaging um, people of color, um, and in fact, it's a POC-led and also POC-dominated and um, involved community. Um, we look at things differently. We know what it's like to be taken advantage of. Uh, we know what it's like to be appropriated. So I think there's a sensitivity and, and nuance of application of how to engage in you know, art practice and social engaged art and to create a cohort and a pipeline of people who have great ideas to, for the public to see. Mm -hmm. And with that, there's not many organizations that do it. There are some, but I'm not gonna shout them out right now. Okay. Um, but with that say, said, I think that LP is a leader in a, a young institution that is identifying um, young creatives who are socially engaged, cultivating them, giving them the resources and tools, Letting, um, sending them back out in the marketplace and then um, supporting them further. So I think that's really important. Yeah. And I just, just to kind of interject, um, you use the word authentic to describe um, the LP um, in relation to other institutions. And I think this idea of authenticity in relation to an institution, whatever mm -hmm. that may be, um, they don't always, they don't usually yeah. go hand in hand. Absolutely. So I was wondering if you could explain what you meant by authentic. Yeah, authentic means that you're speaking from within, you're not speaking from without. Mm -hmm. So like you're not using the, the flavor of the month or the terms that's being uh, pervasive in society just to, you know, um, be marketable or to get funds, but you're really centered in your, your voice, you're really centered in your values, 
really centered in the community that or the audience that you're speaking to and making for, mm -hmm. um, that is authentic rather than, all right, you know what? This is hot right now. Let's use that language. We'll, we'll galvanize our whole community. But then once it's off the table, we're going to scrub that language. We're going to scrub that community no longer serves us. Um, we see that a lot. And we see that in corporatocracy. We also see that in nonprofit. I would say one of the things about the Laundrette Project that I have found really valuable is that not only does it bring together socially active artists, but they, it continues to bring them together. Mm -hmm. So I would say that this mm -hmm. the network is very, they are very intentional about maintaining the network. Um, I still talk to, if not work with, many people that I went through the laundromat project with or we're still you know like we're still in conversation okay. so it was like the conversation happened in this smaller intense period of time but now it's what five years later and we're still in conversation and our practices have changed over five years mm -hmm. we're like oh am i going to apply for a professor job am i going to people are kind of making different decisions but the literally from like the actual the email list to different times of, of the year that they bring people back together i think that's one of the biggest parts of that just the continued, continuing the conversation. So I think you can have um, programs or experiences that are just like one intense time uh, that, and then people go their separate ways and you're kind sure. of like, hey, yeah, I saw you in the gray house. Yeah. But it's different to be like, oh, are we still in conversation? Are we still, are you still working on that question you were working on three yeah. years ago? Mm -hmm. And talking about how it's changed or and why, and it's okay to like let that evolve sure. because yeah. it's not like you're at a fixed, mm -hmm. Your, the, your process is going to change. So I, I would say I really appreciate the continued networking and community building process that they do even after you right. have gone through. All about creating ripple effects as yes. we've been we've been discussing at the LP. And it gives you a really good framework to continue to check in on your work. Mm -hmm. So you have your is it seven principles? I should know. The, for the the LP has like. Yeah, their yes, community. It has six, 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 six principles. Six. <laughs> um, six. Um, but you can continue to revisit those principles because mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to like be dishonest with yourself a little later. Like, is this really community engaged? Is this right. really sure. doing right. this? And you can continue to like revisit it and have a framework that you can use that to communicate with other institutions or partners or spaces yeah, that great, you yeah. want to engage with and say, hey, these are things that are important to me. Are they important to you? Yeah. Right. That, yeah, um, to align yeah so that. having to practice the principles and the process of being a fellow, mm -hmm. but then having a continued framework that you can use it to keep yourself accountable and to create a common ground for communication and value setting when you are working in um, That is all she wrote. But thank you so much for your time today and really enjoyed having me. Thank you. Yeah.